morning, church. Now, it gives me a real pleasure to introduce to you four people, and I'm looking around to see where they are. Albert and Mariana, can you come up here? Yes, please. And uh, where is Juan and Hon? Oh, there they are. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, come up here. Okay, you are wondering, what is this all about? I know that we have many baptisms, but what is this now? It is not baby dedication. It may look like it. <laughs> um, come up here, and we have Juan and Juan with us and their children. Okay, let me tell you, today we are accepting, um, we are accepting Albert and Mariana and Hon and Juan into the membership of our church. And we're doing it by profession of faith. Let me tell you, so you, you would have seen Albert and Mariana here quite regularly in our church. For how long now? More than that. Okay, so about three, four months. And um, they, they have come from a Spanish church, wasn't it? Yes. But before that, they come originally from Venezuela. And uh, so what happened is their membership has not come here and has, they haven't transferred through membership. And the reason the problem they have is because of COVID, that the church is not functioning to its full capacity. So what we are going to do, they will be accepted by profession of faith in our church. And now this brings me uh, to this lovely couple. And uh, uh, it's, it's really my pleasure to present you, uh, well, you would have seen Khan and his wife. I, I'm not sure that I'm pronouncing correct the name. You tell me. Hon. Hon. Okay. Say it again. Hon. Yes, got it. <laughs> I got it in writing, but it is not easy to pronounce it, okay? And let me tell you about them. Uh, they are part of a, actually a bigger group of, number of families who have started coming to our church just during this COVID time. They come from a Baptist background, and during this COVID period, they have been meeting in small groups. And during those time of, as they met as small groups, they have started studying the Bible, and they came across a topic of Sabbath. And as they deeply delved on their own into the study of the Bible on the topic, they were convicted about the importance and the sacredness of Sabbath. And from that time on, they have been coming to our church almost every Sabbath faithfully. And uh, they, have, they have been doing this study and getting to know the Word of God and the truth of God. And, and we are so glad that they have accepted to become members of our church. So today, we are accepting these four people into the membership of our church. We are so glad that they are here with their family. And now, let us do that formal part. I accept Jesus Christ as my personal Savior and Lord, and I desire to live my life in a saving relationship with Him. Yes. I accept the teachings of the Bible as expressed in the statement of fundamental beliefs of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and I pledge by God, God's grace to live my life in harmony with these teachings. Great. Let us pray. Father God, we come to you, and we so want to thank you, Lord, for uh, blessing us as a church, blessing us with these precious souls. We thank you for the journeys of their personal lives. We thank you that the Spirit of God draws people of God to himself. We thank you that we as a church are enriched by who they are and by the talents that they have. We pray, Lord, that you will pour out your Spirit upon them, that they will find not only comfort of the gospel in this church, but that they will use they God-given talents to bless your church and to bless the community around them. So, Lord, please bless them. We ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen.
We are in the series on people from the pages of the Bible that we know, the major characters of the Bible who have encountered God. And today we are talking about another one, and that is the prophet Elijah. Just by the way to tell you, the, the special item that we sang today, Sylvia really did not know what the topic of my sermon was, but she chose the song which perfectly fits what I'm going to talk about. In fact, it's the, the title, the main verse under the song, that special item that we sang is the main verse that I'm really using today, a still small voice. Let's read the text, and we are going to get into it. There he went, meaning Elijah, went into a cave and spent the night. And the word of the Lord came to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? He replied, I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, broken down your altars, and put your prophets to death. With the sword, I am the only one left, and now they are trying to kill me. The Lord said, go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Then a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper. When Elijah heard it, he pulled his cloak over his face and went out and stood at the mouth of the cave. Then the voice said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? He replied, I have been very zealous for the Lord Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, broken down your altars, and put your prophets to death with the sword. I am the only one left, and now they are trying to kill me too. The Lord said to him, go back the way you came and go to the desert of Damascus. When you get there, anoint Hazel, king over Aram. Also anoint Yehu, son of Nimish, Nimshi, king over Israel. And anoint Elisha, son of Shaphat, from Abel Meholah. To succeed you as a prophet, Yahu will put to death any who escape the sword of Hazael, and Elisha will put to death any who escapes the sword of Yahu. Yet I reserve 7,000 in Israel, all whose knees have not bowed down to Baal, and, who, and whose mouths have not kissed him. Let me give you a context for what is it we are going to talk about. Just a general context. You would know that Jews were monotheists. They believed in one God. For millennia, Israel believed in one true God. In other words, there is one God, there is one truth, there is one world view. That's what they, con they were convinced about. They were unique in the ancient world. While the rest of the world was a polytheistic or believed in many gods, Israel believed in one God, one truth, one worldview. For millennia, they still engaged in idol worshipping. In other words, they, like other nations, they started to believe other gods, if you will. So around Israel, they were a very tiny nation, very small country, surrounded by the sea of many mightier nations. 
And all those nations believed in many different gods. In other words, there are many gods, there are many truths, there is no single worldview. I'm putting forward to you, this is the kind of world that we live in. While we insist that there is one worldview, there is one God, there is one truth. The world says you are ridiculous. That's not simply true. There's no one worldview. There's no one truth. And this is pretty much how we today reflect the reality of the ancient times. Israel went through many cycles of rebellion and apostasy and spiritual revival. Time after time after time, when you read the book of Judges, you find that this was happening. There would be a good judge and things would go well. And there would come a bad one and the whole nation would slide down into apostasy and idolatry. So many cycles of this, of this apostasy and spiritual revival was happening throughout the history of Israel. This was happening during the period of judges and later on kings. The story we are talking about here relates to King Ahab, who married Jezebel, who was a daughter of the priest, a king of Tyre and Sidon. This woman, Jezebel, she was a fervent follower of Baal. Not just any type, but a literally a fervent follower of God Baal. She introduced worship of Baal as a national religion among Israel. Imagine Israel that through my, millennia was worshiping Yahweh God. Now, as their national religion, worshiping of Baal became a national religion. What an apostasy. Jezebel brought hundreds of priests and prophets of Baal to Israel who established the worship of Baal. This was the period of the greatest spiritual danger for the nation of Israel. At this time, as this is happening, this is not escaping the mind, eyes, and the heart of God. So what God does, he sends Elijah, who was to become one of the greatest prophets ever, to encounter one of the greatest apostasies ever. But not only does he send Elijah, he sends a drought, one of the greatest droughts that Israel ever went through. For three and a half years, not a single drop of rain fell on the land of Israel. So to counter the greatest apostasy, God sends one of the greatest prophets and one of the greatest droughts to bring his people back to himself in order to spiritually awake Israel from the greatest apostasy. So the story actually picks up before what we read within a text that I have read to you publicly. So Elijah goes to meet King Ahab and challenges him to a spiritual contest on Mount Carmel famous event, and most of you here would know this event. This was a contact, contest between God Yahweh, of whom Elijah was a representative, and Baal, so-called God, and his prophets. What a contest on the top of a Mount Carmel. You see, Baal was a fertility god, and therefore, he should be able to send rain. If anyone, then he is supposed to send rain. And remember, Israel was going through a period of drought for three and a half years. 
450 prophets showed up on the top of Mount Carmel, Baal's prophets. And there on the top of the mountain, there is this sole figure, Elijah himself. And then you have all these spectators who are observing and watching what is happening. Thousands of Israelites show up on Mount Carmel. And the show is about to start. Baal's prophets built an altar. As they built an altar, they start praying. They start to go into the mode of worship. They start to pray. They start to chant. They start to dance. And this goes on and on and on. It went for hours. But nothing was happening. They start to cut themselves. Somehow to invoke the mercy of their God. To hear them. At noon, Bible says that literally... Elijah starts to taunt them because it becomes ridiculous what they have been doing for hours and nothing happens. So he kind of almost is helping them out because nothing is happening. He says, shout louder. Surely he's God. But perhaps he's in deep thought or busy or, or traveling. Maybe he's sleeping and must be awakened. There's something in translation that gives to, to a sense that, as if Elijah said, maybe he went to toilet. This is literally could be translated when you read in Hebrew. He's literally taunting them. As for hours, they keep praying. Cutting themselves, dancing, doing every sort of gymnastic they can come up with. Nothing happens. And Elijah starts to, starts to, 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 to make things even more interesting. And they go on until the evening, but nothing happened. Nothing happened. When they probably felt exhausted... And, and, and the singing and dancing and, and praying just totally was over. Elijah steps up. He builds a new altar with 12 stones representing 12 tribes of Israel. And he sacrificed a bull. And then he says, put water on it. A lot and a lot of water on it and around it. And they do it. Somehow in the midst of this drought, they found the precious water. And then Elijah prayed and he said, O Lord God of Abraham, Isaac and Israel, let it be known today that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant and have done all these things at your command. Answer me, O oh Lord. Answer me. So these people will know that you, O oh Lord, are God. And that you are turning their hearts back again. As Elijah prays, fire comes down and consumes the sacrifice. The whole altar is consumed. People are at awe. They start shouting, the Lord is God. The Lord is God. This was a contest, remember. The Israelites were to be judges of who is God. And they, the judgment came through the mouth of the people. God, the Lord is God. The Lord Jehovah is God. Prophets of Baal were killed that day. The story continues. A little cloud appears up in the sky and becomes bigger and ever so bigger. 
Elijah say, run, king, run, go back to the palace. It's going to pour. It's going to pour. He hops on a chariot and leaves. Jezebel was not there that day. And there was a time for a decision. As Ahab goes back to the court, he is to share what happened on top of Mount Carmel with his wife. And this was a time of a decision for Ahab and for Jezebel. What were they going to decide? This was her decision. May the gods deal with me, be it ever so severely, if by this time tomorrow I do not make your life like that or one of them. That was a decision. And Elijah, what happens to him? Elijah starts running away. He himself went a day's journey into the desert. He came to a broom tree, sat down under it, and prayed that he, what? That he might die. What on earth is going on? He just experienced an incredible event on top of Mount Carmel. And now he's in the depths of of depression and suicidal thoughts. Elijah becomes depressed and totally suicidal. Why on earth? Why? Why, Elijah? Afraid of Jezebel? What on earth is going on? Very often at the heart, so we need to look into this. Is this just a, a fear of Jezebel? Is it? Probably not, but let's look at it. At the height of spiritual success, some of Baba's greatest heroes would say, God, please let me die. Moses would say, God, let me die. Elijah would say, God, let me die. Jonah would say the same. At the height of their greatest spiritual success, suddenly going into depression, even suicidal thoughts. Here are the questions. So this is all the background now, all the background. Now we are going to go into the heart of it. What does God do for the depressed and suicidal Elijah? We are going to look at that. I think there are some really good practical lessons we can learn, especially for people who go through, through depression. But there is even more important question we are going to, to look at, and that is what do we learn about people? And ourselves. And what do we learn about God from the experience of Carmel? What do we learn? Now, what does, God do, what does God do for Elijah, who is so depressed and suicidal? There are a couple of things. First, he revives him. Second, he says, okay, I'll do something else for you. I will bring you back to normal life. But then, I will meet you face to face, if you will. You and I are going to have a rendezvous moment. Just two of us. Why? Because I want you to learn something. Okay. So the first thing he does, he revives him. Then he says, okay, we are going to meet. We are going to have a rendezvous moment. And then, I want to teach you something. Okay, here's the first thing. He revives him. Look what happened. Let's look at the text. All at once, an angel touched him. So, Elijah fled. And exhausted, he finally comes to a heap, if you will, and falls asleep with these suicidal thoughts and depressed. Now look, all at once an angel touched him and said, get up and eat. He looked around and there by his head was a cake of bread over hot coals and jar of water. 
He ate and drank, and they lay down. The angel of the Lord came back a second time and touched him and said, Get up and eat, for the journey is too much for you. Do you see what God does? What God does first, God gives him to eat after a good sleep. Nothing like a good sleep. I slept last night so nice. I tell you, when you can't sleep well, that's a curse. It's not good. I'm so glad that as Elijah was going through depression, that he was at least able to sleep. Because that doesn't happen with people who are depressed very often. But God allowed him to have a sleep. And then he gave him food to eat. God said nothing. Just brought food. Sleep well. I want you to revive. No lecture. No counseling. Did you see that? And he, he did that twice. He ate. He slept. When he ate, he fell asleep again. He said, okay, good. And then he wakes up and he says, here it is. Eat again. He must have slept for another who knows how long. How good is that? Wouldn't you love to have many hours of sleep sometimes? I'm seeing some heads nodding. Hey, you have today. This afternoon you can sleep if you're really, really tired. Yeah? That's Sabbath. Sabbath is for, for good physical rest. But Sabbath is for good spiritual rest. But that's not all. We'll come back to that too. So God gives him to eat some more. So no lecture, no counseling, just reviving him. You see, God revived him physically. He revived him mentally. He revived him emotionally without saying a word. Without saying a word. But there is more underneath that God has to deal with. There's much more underneath that God has to deal with. But first, first things first. Physical rest, mental rest, emotional rest, and then we are going to deal with other stuff. Then God says, okay, Elijah, now you're ready. I have a second thing I want to do for you. You and I, we are going to meet, okay? We're going to meet. So he meets him at Mount Horeb. Where is the Mount of Horeb? What is the Mount of Horeb? Mount Sinai. What a place. What a place. Meeting at Mount Sinai. So he wants him to experience the presence of God. He revived him. He says, now I want you to experience my presence. But the way God wants him to experience his presence is quite an interesting one. There's this incredible wind that just blows everything. And that is that just comes out of nowhere. So God wants him to experience the power of kind of incredible, natural, but still a powerful, powerful wind. Then after the wind, I think that was the order. Check. Don't trust me always, okay? Uh, there was an earthquake. Again, a power is displayed. Earthquake. A massive earthquake that happens. Falling of rocks. Power at display. And then there was fire. Suddenly fire appears. What on earth is going on? So, so Elijah is experiencing this. All of his senses are engaged. Wow. What? He is he's protected within a cleft of a rock. So he's not exposed to a danger. But he's experiencing at the same time all this power, wind, earthquake, fire, bang, one after the other. Then suddenly everything stops. Everything stops. And here's a voice. And he knew this is different. 
all until now, my senses were blinded about by powerful display of what God was doing. And now this is in character totally different, totally different. Just a voice, not any kind of voice, not a booming voice, but a small voice. Just a whispering voice, whispering voice. The Bible, biblical Hebrew tells us it's like a breath, ruach, small voice. What is happening? Why does God want him, Elijah, to, to meet him this way? In two different ways. One, powerful. And the other one, a small voice. Why? He revived him. He told him, we are going to meet. And through this meeting that I will have with you, I'm going to teach you something. What? What are you going to teach me? He wanted to teach him something about people about himself and about God. What? What do we learn from the experience that Elijah had about people? People who went through ex apostasy, who turned their back to God, who embraced other gods, other truths, other philosophies, and turn their back to God and God's truth. What is God going to teach him through this encounter about people? What is God going to teach him about himself? Number one. He's going to tell him, Elijah, you were too positive about people. And Elijah, you are too negative about people. Let me explain. One of the greatest things and the great biggest reason why Elijah was so disappointed to the point of depression and suicide that he wanted to kill himself is the fact that after the display of God's power and who God was on the Mount Carmel, there was no change in the hearts of people. That's what he would say later on. This happened, but I'm kind of the, still the only one who is left. How come that such a powerful display of who you are is not going to turn the hearts of people to you? He's so depressed, so disappointed with people. Let me ask you, have you been disappointed in people? The greatest disappointment is not with a stranger, but people who are closer to you. Your friends, your family, they inflict the greatest hurt. You would think they know better. People simply disappoint. They do it over and over again. And what Elijah cannot understand, how could they be so, uh, so stubborn? How could they be so stubborn? So hard-hearted hard that after God did so much and showed them who he is, they were immovable. He said, I don't want to live anymore. I don't want to live. He became too pessimistic. I thought for sure this is going to make all the difference, but it didn't. Here is a point. Here is a point, folks. Please don't be disappointed with people, even with yourself to the extent, even though you and I need a depth of repentance. Elijah had a theology of sin which was too shallow. Too shallow. 
In other words, this was his theology. If you could do a couple of things, in this case, if God is going to show his power, it will make all the difference. If miracle happens, it will make all the difference. People will turn. Everything will be hunky-dory. But it didn't. In other words, his theology of sin was sin is not a big thing. Just a few things can happen and we can think, turn things around. But the biblical of theology of sin is much, much deeper. If you come to understand who you are, in essence, you understand that deeply I am a sinful person. Not only what I say, not only what I do wrong, but my thoughts and my motives very often are selfish and self-centered. Sin permeates deep within us. Elijah's theology of sin was superficial. And therefore, the depth of disappointment we, because of people. Please don't be disappointed with people because that shows you that your theology of sin is totally wrong. And you've been coming to church for such a long period of time. And you keep coming and thinking that that person should know better. Of course that person should know better. But you also need to understand that sin is serious business. Do you get it? I need to get it. I'm preaching to myself. You know that, don't you? And this is true. This is really true. If you have a shallow theology of sin, you will be disappointed with people over and over again. And your understanding of yourself is also shallow. He's shocked. He's depressed because of it. He wants to die. You see, I couldn't but talk a bit politics, okay? You see, the ideologies of both sides of politics, liberal or conservative, the essential problem of both is their understanding, a shallow understanding of human nature. Don't you agree with that? It's absolutely a shallow understanding of who we are as people, which is, in essence, we are sinful. So the thought is, this is my ideology, and this is what I propose, how we turn around the ills of the world. And it will work. As if it is all about certain kind of thinking and certain kind of um, things that we need to apply and everything will be okay. So in other words, if my program is adopted it will solve all the problems. But does it? And we are achieve, uh, people at each other's throats on all both sides of politics when they essentially neglect who human beings are. So there is constant perpetuation of hope we can fix this, we can fix this, we can fix this. If you do this, if you do this, if you follow this ideology, we can fix this. And you over and over and over and over again fail and fail and fail and fail, and you go into despair. So from hope into despair, from hope into despair, constantly happening in politics. A shallow theology of sin is what is happening. The real problem of the world are not liberals or conservatives or their politics, but how terrible sin is and how all-permeating sin is. But Elijah was not only 
too positive about human nature, he became too negative about human nature. You know what he said? I'm the only one. Yeah? Did you see that? I'm the only one who is faithful. And that can become our problem. Yeah, can't it? I'm the only one. And there are just few. And I become preoccupied with self and the right teachings and, and somehow I find I find the truth in in that and I'm I see everybody else is wrong and I'm the only one who is right and so he became too negative. He goes from one extreme to the other. And this is a sign of pride, potentially a sign of a pride. And we can become proudful, can't we? And, and he went into two extremes, two extremes. His distorted view of sin makes him take extreme position, too positive and too negative. But look what God says. Hey, Elijah, there are 7,000 people. Or faithful, at least seven. While God is disappointed with the unfaithfulness of his people, he doesn't go into extreme. He understands the human nature. He understands that human nature is going to pin him to the cross. But he says, um, they are still redeemable. People are still redeemable. People are still redeemable. So don't go into the extreme thinking too badly or too positively about them. Don't have a too shallow theology of sin. People are redeemable. You and I are redeemable. Isn't that a great news? So what is God's message through earthquake, wind, wind, and fire? What is it? Why is God contrasting a violent, powerful event of earthquake, fire, and wind to a still small voice? Obviously, you can see that he is contrasting it. Because all over and over again, it says, but God was not in the wind. But God was not in the earthquake. But God was not in the fire. So he's contrasting these powerful natural events with a still, small voice. Why? Lesson number one is this. Mount Carmel was all about wind, earthquake, and fire. It was all about it, wasn't it? This was a dramatic event which did not change people's lives. If only I would experience miracle, everything would change. No, it wouldn't. Mount Carmel was all about undeniable miracle which appeals to senses but does not last. God, if you do this miracle, I'll believe you or I'll serve you. God is not, God is in the business of doing miracles, but that's not primary for him. You will know God better if you, in the quietness of time, listen, listen to a small voice, a word, his word. And the Spirit of God that suddenly starts to enlighten your mind. You'll be always better off for it. This is how you find God. Because he says, I'm not in the fire. I am not in an earthquake. Yes, I'm using it as a judgment. But I'm not in it. I am not in it. But I am in a still small voice. God can do Mount Carmel miracle, but he's not found in it. We encounter him in a still, small voice. God touches 
heart through still small voice, God's wor word speaking to us is the one that changes us. Here's lesson number two. Wind, earthquake, and fire are the instruments of God's judgment. Because judgment did come that day. But his still small voice is a gentleness of his grace. I'd like to hear amen on this one. Wind, earthquake, and fire are instruments of his judgment, but a still, small voice is an instrument of his grace. This is God of three angels' message. This is a creator God who is God of salvation or God of grace and God of judgment at the same time. You see, God's primary way is a still small voice, is where he is and how he typically deals with us. This is God's primary way of dealing with us through a small, still small voice. His secondary way of dealing with us is a judgment. But it's not his natural way. Martin Luther would say that when judgments come and when tough things happen in our lives, so God wants our attention through judgments. And so that we turn towards him. That's not his primary way. Martin Luther would say that's God's strange way. Not a primary way. So, here in this encounter, God wants to tell Elijah, Elijah, it's not about earthquake. It's not about wind. It's not about fire. Yes, I do use them. I do use them as, as instruments to bring my people back to myself. But that's not my primary way. My primary way is a still, small voice of grace. Elijah's encounter with God is teaching us that we can have daily encounter with God. Do you see that? Because what we are talking about here is encounters with God of people so it can teach us something. So this type of encounter we can have every day. Every day. We don't need to expect miraculous event. They will show up. They will show up. And we will see them. Even when we don't talk to each other and, and, a, and a song is chosen, you know, that perfectly fits. That's a little miracle, jolly miracle, you know. And they will happen along the way. But it's not God's primary way of dealing with us. We must expect a still, small voice. And I, and I guarantee you, when the Spirit of God draws you to Himself and when you start praying and when you start, when you start to engage with the Word of God, you will be enlightened. The Spirit will breathe, will breathe and talk to you. You will be so much better for it. Enlightened mind, a clear mind, mind that understands, mind that is suddenly rooted in the assurance of who God is and His love. He becomes a courageous mind, becomes a dedicated mind. And that's what God wants you, to encounter that still, small voice on a daily basis. God's primary way is to bring salvation and grace and in Jesus to take upon himself the judgment. Do you see that? Well, let me, let me explain. This is a gospel moment also. Gospel moment. Grace and love of God brings salvation to us and judgment on Jesus. 
while it's true that the judgment at the end of time for those who have not accepted Jesus will fall upon the people who don't accept him. And that happens even now, not only at the end of time. But the good news of the gospel is that none of us need to perish. But we can all have eternal life because judgment was inflicted on Christ. Our sins have inflicted a death blow on to Jesus. And as that happened, salvation is given to us. How awesome is that? This makes all the difference. This makes all the difference. And lesson number four, the voice calls to a mission. He tells Elijah, hey, go and anoint a foreign king, a jolly thing. Did you see that? Not just a Jewish king? Hello. That's strange. But let's, let's not dwell on it. But then also anoint a, a, a Hebrew king and anoint also the one who will succeed you, and that is Elisha. Go on a mission. You have work to do. Get up. Get up. Time to go. So what happened? He gave him rest. He revived him. He met him. He taught him about himself and about people. And he says, now you understand. You're revived. Off you go. How good is that? How good is that? The same thing for us, people. When you meet God, when you understand who he is, when you're revived, when he teaches you, then he tells you, off you go. Off you go. Share my gospel with others. I pray that this was a blessing for you. So don't pray to God that you have supernatural encounter with God. Miracle. Meet him every day. Meet him every day. In a still small voice.